Hello and good morning and welcome to our Ransomware Recovery web webinar presented by Philippe Villop, Field CTO at Rubric. Um, I'll now pass you over to my colleague Joe Hepburn who will be going through today's agenda in a little more detail. Hi guys, thanks for joining today uh, and thanks Daniela. Uh, my name is Joe Hepburn so I'm a data management specialist here at Byte. So, we look after any technologies that sit in the backup, disaster recovery, governance and analytics space. Um, we see Rubrik as a, uh, a kind of a, a real next gen player in the, in the backup market. Uh, and the reason for that is that they give you a lot more for your investment than just a backup tool. So they, they have a lot more differences than some of the legacy technologies that we've traditionally worked with in the market. And uh, we're going to take you through a few of those differences today. So the agenda for today is how COVID-19 has made organisations more vulnerable to attacks. And that's certainly something we're seeing uh, from a Bytes perspective and the customers that we're talking to. How Rubrik enables rapid recovery from a ransomware attack the true value of an immutable backup architecture, how Rubrik provides granular visibility to quickly identify impacted files following an attack, and how Rubrik uses machine learning anomaly detection for enhanced ransomware defense. So with that, I'll hand over to Philippe to take you through the slides. Thanks very much, Joe. All right, sorry about that. My uh, laptop refused service this morning. Um, so yeah, what I wanted to do is uh, just to take you one step back to just before the uh, COVID pandemic, if that's okay. So initially there was this um, promise, let's say from the hacker community that they would not uh, go after uh, specifically healthcare providers or companies or organizations that were dealing with uh, the COVID pandemic and trying to solve it. Uh, but obviously that didn't uh, last very long, uh, that promise. And actually, you know, recent figures put uh, cybercrime up uh, 75% uh, during the crisis itself. So that's also reflected in, in the headlines. If you sort of look at what's going on, uh, what we see in the press now is that uh, ransomware continues unabated and basically, you know, any and all organizations now uh, are dealing with these, uh, with these cyber attacks um, and sort of need to figure out how to best respond to it. Um, if we look at, you know, who are they targeting specifically, there's some new research that recently came out from Microsoft um, that now shows that attackers are actually making this crisis uh, worse, uh, of course. So they're, you know, forcing this dual train of thought uh, for these healthcare providers and, and critical infrastructure organizations, where they not only have to deal with the crisis, but now they also have to sort of safeguard themselves or pay extra attention to, uh, to the fact that they're being targeted. Because if you now target a organization that's dealing with the crisis, the you know the headline will be uh, will be much bigger, and also the potential payout will be uh, quicker uh, because these people really don't have uh, have any time to waste. Uh, so the last ten months, they saw uh, 140 local governments and you know police stations and hospitals being held hostage uh, by ransomware, and that's just in the uh, in the US alone. We also see that it's going beyond uh, on-premises infrastructure components. Uh, so it's now also spreading to things like SaaS applications. Uh, what you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there is that, you know, even if you're running uh, your infrastructure and your calibration service, for example, in Office 365, uh, that those services are now being targeted as well. Um, so the sort of the, the tagline of the session is don't pay the bad guys or don't pay uh, pay the ransom, uh, which potentially is uh, is easier said than done, of course. Uh, so the picture on the left here is it's in, in Dutch because I couldn't find an English translation, but this is basically the Dutch Minister of Justice and, and Security uh, pleading to the cybercrime insurance uh, companies to not pay, uh, pay the ransom in case of uh, ransomware attacks. Um, so the, 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 message behind it is uh, you know similar to uh, st state actors um, 
you know, holding people, uh, holding people at ransom is that, you know, you don't negotiate with terrorists, but if it's your data, um, that's now being, un, you know, is now unavailable and you have to deal with it. It's, it's uh, of course, much easier said than done. So if you then combine this with the COVID-19 pandemic and look at the shifting priorities and trade-offs that we saw. So um, the screenshot on the left is obviously a bit of a, a bit of a tongue in cheek, but uh, if you sort of look at the digital transformation and the responses that companies had to go through to make sure that people now can work from home and that these you know, processes are being digitalized so, uh, so collaboration can happen uh, across the internet, um, there's a lot, a lot more uh, uh, of these things going on, and a lot quicker responses uh, that we've seen from from companies who, in the past, have been a bit reluctant uh, to think about things like SaaS and public cloud and so on. The initial response was sort of focused on, you know, how can we improve communication between our teams? How can we make sure that if people are now, you know, working from home uh, for the majority of the time, how can they collaborate? Do they have the right tools? And can we actually do our processes from A to Z if uh, we're not physically in the office? So there's a lot of, you know, people work involved in, in a lot of these business processes. And then the question became if, uh, if they could be fully digitized uh, or at least they could uh, still continue to happen from home. The sort of end result that we saw is that people opted for speed over security. So they, you know, got a lot of people working from home, but they didn't really had the means to um, you know, think through some of the implications in terms of security and, and are we using some best practices there or are we just uh, responding um, to the need to uh, work from home. Uh, agility over efficiency. Uh, so again, a lot of uh, things weren't really fully baked out, fully thought through. And then ecosystem over strategy in terms of um, it, it didn't really matter uh, what tools the people were starting to use, um, you know, very, very diverse sets of collaboration and communication software um, we've seen being rolled out. Um, so there wasn't really an overarching uh, strategy uh, behind uh, behind a lot of this. Um, similar to, um, to what I saw in my own uh, home life, um, so uh, my wife who predominantly works at the office, she now had to work from home full time. And what they did for their uh, employees is they, you know, they found a couple of laptops they had lying around in the closet somewhere, and they, uh, you know, they shipped them, um, shipped them to the remote workers now. Um, but none of that was really, you know, in terms of security, really thought through. So they had different versions of Windows on there, different versions of malware on there. Uh, some of them were, you know, still active. Some of them were expired. And then once they got connected, they had questions like, how do we access you know, our business applications? How do we work with the ERP systems? How do we connect over VPN into our office? How do we do things like uh, route phone traffic? Uh, so there's like these uh, centralized numbers that they were unable to use now. And then in terms of how do we collaborate with data, uh, even simple things like how can we all work on the same spreadsheet? Uh, so those. So those were some of the questions they didn't really have uh, answers to or um, responses to. I, I recently saw something similar uh, pop up in a in a, uh, a Gartner post that talks about an exit strategy. Um, you know, after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, how are you know enterprises responding, and how can they get sort of back to a sense of normalcy, and they sort of divided it in, in three major sections. So there was a response, a recover, and a, and a renew um, um, process. Um, and I think that's that's really what we're going through. So in the in the renew stage, where we're sort of slowly moving towards, we're going to have to think about these things now, and go back and fix some of these past mistakes uh, to make sure that we are uh, uh, we're again working with the best security posture uh, possible. There were some other foreseen consequences as well. Um, so this is a, a tweet I captured from, from one of our existing customers. Uh, you know, some of these things, you, you don't really think about them uh, when all of a sudden you now have to have to work from home. Um, so this was the um, uh, University of Cranfield where they sort of pointed out that at least now they don't have to go into the office to, to change tapes because they have this uh, modernized uh, uh, data management solution. So some of these things all of a sudden were not were not possible anymore. 
if we then sort of switch gears a little bit and, and talk about the ransomware aspect and what uh, you know Rubrik is doing in this field specifically, if you sort of look at the total addressable market uh, for these ransomware actors, the FBI puts it at uh, over a billion dollars uh, this year. So this is not the you know economical damage that companies uh, uh, have to deal with. It's really just the the payouts that are expected to go to these uh, ransomware actors is uh, is crossing a billion dollars. Um, so you really have to um, consider the, uh, you know, the amount of, uh, of of action that we'll see in this field going forward. If you then sort of look at why organizations are paying potentially these ransoms, is this you have to deal with, you know, extended downtime. Uh, the average recovery time is is over seven days, uh, according to Forrester, and in some cases it's it's much much longer. Uh, so there have been, you know, some very very public cases in in the media. Uh, you know, last year we had Maersk, TNT, and so on, uh, and and you know, the, the amount of time they were offline uh, far extended this uh, 7.3 days. I just saw an article yesterday in the local news here in Belgium where a uh, a company called Alcoa uh, was offline for for many many weeks, uh, months even, and they recently tried to um, sell their company to to an, in, an investment firm. And they ended up uh, estimating that they lost about two hundred million dollars of uh, of market capital uh, in that deal just because of the uh, uh, just because of the past ransomware events. The other part is people are you know unable to recover. Uh, typically, what happens now is that um, you know ransomware actors get into your network and they first go after the online backup system. Um, so they make sure that you don't have a recovery path. Uh, back, there's no restoration part, um, and even uh, going further, uh, sometimes what we see is that they um, extract data as well now. So they make sure that they encrypt your backups, they encrypt your primary storage, but they also have an, a copy uh, of your data that they've extracted off-premises, uh, which they sort of threaten you with uh, as well in terms of data exposure. And then finally, there's a lack of visibility to the scope, uh, meaning that you don't there's no easy way to figure out what exactly has been impacted and what has not been impacted. There's a lot of manual labor that needs to happen, a lot of manual work um, to figure that out. And then uh, you have to still go through the uh, recovery process itself. Um, so we say that you know prevention is definitely essential and attacks will, will still happen. Um, so from a rubric perspective, I'm definitely not claiming that uh, we are the silver bullet against ransomware. Uh, we are part of a defense in depth strategy, and that's how you should uh, think about this aspect. I mean, there's no single solution that will, um, you know, protect you against ransomware. That's that's not the point. But the idea really is that if you take all of the preventive measures that you're supposed to take, you take care of your physical security layer, your networking, you make sure your endpoint systems are up to date, uh, applications are patched, and your data is secured and replicated still attacks will happen because the you know the ransomware uh, attacks keep evolving in terms of sophistication but you also have to deal with uh, malicious insiders uh, so people who don't have to deal with the uh, preventive measures and typically have direct access to applications and data so these things will uh, will remain uh, this is a number we um, uh, we got from sophos where they say that 75 of uh, companies that were targets of ransomware or were infected with ransomware were running up-to-date endpoint protection. So prevention, yes, uh, part of an end-to-end -end chain, absolutely, but uh, uh, we see these attacks still happen. So the question then becomes how fast can you recover? So it's more of a question of if um, or when, not if, uh, it will happen and then you know the question becomes uh, how much data am I going to lose? How much time am I going to lose? Uh, and how quickly can I get back to production? Um, as mentioned before, what we see more and more is that you know people are going after uh, backup data first. So this is an example of the uh, Ryuk attack chain. Um, it's uh, you know the full explanation is listed on that on that blog post from Microsoft. But in this case. Uh, they spent over 200 days uh, in the customer's network uh, before actually encrypting the data. Uh, so obviously, what they're trying to do is they're, uh, you know, trying to figure out credentials to get uh, as broadly as possible into the network uh, to be able to not only encrypt production, 
data, but also make sure that the customer doesn't have a path to recovery. Um, so that's uh, the focus really of Rubrik is to make sure that we are that storage of last resort uh, in case the ransomware event happens. Uh, how can you leverage some of our solutions to uh, get back to production as quickly as possible? Um, if you do it manually, um, recovery is uh, a heavy lift. So the first thing that you have to do is to figure out what was the impact. Um, so identifying the anomaly is typically not an issue. Typically your end users will uh, will figure it out before you. Um, so there's uh, there's gonna be indications of, uh, of ransomware happening typically on end user machines or data unavailability. And obviously you will, you will hear about that. The problem is that you don't really know what the total impact was. Uh, so typically what you'll do is you'll have to sort of compare what you had before uh, with what happened after the attack and then figure out, you know, all of the data that was impacted typically to scripting or manual identification. And then you can sort of start the recovery process, which in a lot of cases is going to be a matter of days to weeks uh, to restore back to uh, to full production. Um, so our focus is a little bit different. So the way that we approach this is um, we have this concept of instant recovery with Rubrik. So if you compare us with a traditional backup and recovery solution, uh, we've always had this uh, idea that you can leverage backup data for more uh, than just uh, restoring it. Um, the idea here is that we can spin up copies of backup data for test and development, but you could just as easily spin up copies of data for quick recovery. So the idea really is that we have this concept of you know, instant recovery or live mount, whereby we can leverage the built-in storage capacity of the rubric system to bring the data back sort of immediately, uh, typically in a matter of minutes, and then you run the data set off of the rubric system itself before you even think about you know, streaming it back to production. So the benefit here is that I'm back in production as quickly as I can, and you know, after my end users have access to their data again, then I can start thinking about, you know, getting that data back to my production storage systems. But the main goal really is to restore production as quickly as possible. Then the second aspect of it is immutability. So the system that we designed um, has immutability sort of baked in from day zero. So what I mean by that is we've designed our own file system. Uh, it's called Atlas, and the idea really is that the file system that we have is only available from the Rubrik backup software itself. So our file system is not exposed on the customer's network. Um, it's not exposed using you know, well-known um, uh, protocols like NFS or SMB, meaning that if you compare this with a traditional backup solution where you would have a, you know, a disk-based backup system sitting on a network, uh, that has to be accessible uh, from a third-party backup software system. So, you know, it doesn't really matter which vendor you're going with, that vendor has to write its data to that disk-based storage system somehow. And typically that happens over NFS or SMB, so the data has to transfer your production network and go to that, to that backup system. That means that that access is also available for these ransomware actors or these hacker, hackers. Um, so they can access those uh, disk-based backup systems, those online disk-based backup systems through well-known protocols, and they can encrypt your data before going after your production system. In the case of Rubrik, that doesn't uh, apply. So our uh, backup system, our storage system is immutable. Um, so the, the end result that you get is you create a backup of a, a production application or a data set. You write it to our storage backend, you write it to the Atlas file system, and once it's written, it's a read-only object for the remainder of its life. So the idea really is that if you are able to take a backup of a non-impacted system, uh, so you're backing up during normal operations, the data gets stored on our file system, there's this sort of implicit guarantee that that data cannot be encrypted because it's read-only data. And if you bring it back through instant recovery, for example, uh, you will have that data back in an unencrypted fashion, in an unimpacted form, so you can continue running. And the final piece is really how can we help you with uh, the visibility piece of it. Uh, so really what we'll, what we'll do is uh, every time we take a backup, we create a full index of that uh, application and data set that we're backing up. 
we can compare that index uh, to all of the previous versions. So the idea really is if there's an impact at some point, uh, we'll figure out exactly what has been impacted and we can compare that with the unimpacted version. So we can tell you in a very granular way exactly which servers, which files uh, have been encrypted and what's the actual data set that you have to recover. Um, so how does it work sort of behind the scenes? Um, you know, from a rubric in general perspective, uh, we use this concept of quick start, whereby there's no real software front end that you have to install. Um, it's a, you know, converged system, a distributed converged system. Typically we show up with an appliance uh, in the customer's environment. The only thing we really require is a couple of IP addresses to build out the cluster. And then it sort of forms itself and has the ability to auto discover workloads in your environment. Uh, so for example, you point it to your uh, virtualization management system, maybe vCenter in the case of VMware. We figure out all of the applications that you're running on that platform. And through this concept of SLAs, we're able to automatically assign uh, protection to those applications and start backing them up into a rubric. We can leverage then that instant RTO using live mount. Um, so we can do that for virtual machines. We can do that for physical databases as well, whereby we use the built-in storage capacity of Rubrik to instantly restore those systems um, without any dependency on the actual production data uh, storage arrays. The system is secure in uh, the sense of having an immutable file system, as I explained, but also in the sense of encrypting all of the data end-to-end. -end. So if we pull data out of your production systems, we'll encrypt that data um, over the network, and if we store the data on our file system, we'll encrypt it at rest as well. If you then choose to push that data to a third party storage location, maybe the public cloud or maybe you know, object storage on premises, we'll encrypt that data again in flight and at rest where it lands in its final destination. So all of the data is always uh, fully encrypted, uh, in our case using uh, AIS-256 encryption. On top of that, uh, we now have a solution that we call Radar, which is a machine learning based anomaly detection system. So essentially what we'll do is we can, on the basis of backup data, we can figure out if, there's have, if there has been an anomaly uh, in that data set and if that anomaly is related to ransomware or not. Uh, so the idea really is we're able to build out an historical baseline of normal behavior for each and every object, for each and every customer. So let's say the object is a file server that you wanted to protect you're backing up this file server maybe you know twice a day or once a day. And over time, we build out this um, framework of uh, normal behavior. So we'll establish a baseline that says for this file server, what we typically see between each and every backup is maybe you created you know, a thousand files, you've modified 500 files and you've deleted 200 files. Let's say that's sort of the normal range we're expecting. A new backup happens after the ransomware uh, event has been triggered and we all of a sudden see you know, the file system activity skyrocketing. So all of a sudden you have thousands and thousands of modified files and deleted files. So that would constitute an anomaly based upon that machine learning model. And he will then sort of trigger a second phase of investigation whereby, whereby we're gonna look for specific signs of, of ransomware. Uh, so things like, very simple things like did the extension change of a file, but also things like we look at the entropy of, of the data set that we're protecting. If the entropy or the randomness crosses a certain boundary, that's a very, very good indication of saying, yes, this has been encrypted, this is ransomware. So we now have an additional layer of certainty of uh, saying, uh, yes, this was abnormal behavior and it's related to ransomware, or this was abnormal behavior, but it's related to you know, somebody copying an entire file structure across two, uh, two different machines, for example. So that granular visibility uh, helps us then to sort of um, show you the total impact uh, of the ransomware event and then only cover in a very granular way the, uh, the impacted data. So um, if you sort of compare it at a high level, uh, versus a traditional system. In a traditional uh, architecture, you have a mutable file system, meaning there's external client access with the ability to change data uh, on that backup system. 
we have the uh, immutable approach, so there's no external client access. Uh, if you look at the cluster design, uh, in a typical architecture, there's a full trust cluster design, uh, meaning once you are able to authenticate, uh, you're in. In the rubrics case, we have this zero trust cluster design. Anything is secured, so even the cluster talking amongst itself, between the cluster nodes itself, that's fully encrypted using TLS, using self-signed certificates. Um, there's no backup validation in a traditional at-risk architecture, meaning that you restore data, but you, you really didn't have any clue uh, if that data is still valid, uh, like did bit flips, was there bit rot in any of this uh, data set? Whereas with Rubrik, we run this continual validation. We do fingerprinting, both at the logical and physical level, uh, to make sure that that data never change. And then finally, in a traditional architecture, the burden really is on the end user or the administrator uh, to configure it for redundancy, high availability, security, and so on. Where in our approach, that's fully baked in, that's fully built in, uh, and we sort of assume that uh, responsibility. Uh, so two quick examples of uh, of customers uh, that are using our approach. So the first one is using the the radar approach, and the second one uh, is more relying on the uh, on the Atlas immutable file system. So the first one is ASL Airlines in France. Um, um, so they're a, a delivery services uh, operator. So they work for people like FedEx and DHL and so on. Uh, so they're a cargo um, uh, airline. Uh, the idea or the, the issue that they have though is due to FCC regulation, uh, especially after 9-11, uh, what they have to do is they'll have to be able to show exactly, uh, you know, the manifest of what they're carrying uh, on, their, uh, on their operating airlines or operating airplanes at any point in time. So if they get an inquiry uh, from, an of, from an official service, they sort of have to be able to respond in a matter of minutes. And if their data is not available, they can't respond to that request and they actually have to land the airplane. Uh, so they use Rubrik uh, radar for ransomware, automated ransomware detection and anomaly detection um, to sort of make sure that their data sets are not impacted and they have uh, you know, data availability at, at all times. The second quick example I wanted to point out is uh, Kern Medical Center in the US uh, in Bakersfield. Uh, so what they do is they uh, they rely on the Atlas file system, the immutable file system that each and every of our customers has as a as a built-in part of our standard solution. Uh, but what they uh, what they went through is they installed Rubrik for a specific part of their infrastructure. So they started backing up a specific set of applications and data, and then they discovered a ransomware attack. Uh, so they noticed the ransomware attack. It took about an hour for them to figure out uh, that their data was impacted. So basically, they used Rubrik's instant recovery and immutable file system, uh, which gave them a near zero RTO to return back to operations uh, very, very quickly. Um, so for them, they, they really had this benefit of this, uh, this read-only file system. Um, if I sort of, from a high level, talk you through the, the radar workflow, and then I'll sort of jump into, uh, into a demo to sort of show you what it looks like in reality. Um, so it's really a combination of, of two things that we, uh, that we bring to market. So we have our backup system uh, called Rubrik CDM, which has the immutable file system. And we have this SaaS-based service called Polaris Radar, which really hosts that machine learning model that uses the metadata that our backup system generates to sort of figure out if uh, there's anomalies or if it's uh, if, or if it's normal uh, normal activity. So really, the way it works is there's a ransomware attack. Your production data gets impacted. You run a backup with uh, with Rubrik. Each and every time you run a backup, we create you know this metadata description of what happened on the file system. We send that to the Polaris radar system. This doesn't contain any end user data. It's just purely metadata based. We do this stage one analysis to figure out if this is normal file system activity or if we think it is suspect. If we think it is suspect, we ask the Rubrik CDM appliance, so the on-prem appliance, to sort of mount that suspected workload. And then we'll start that stage two analysis uh, on the on-premises system. And the results of that stage two analysis uh, are sent back to radar. 
then the machine learning model determines this is normal or this is ransomware. If it's ransomware, we'll send out an email alerting the administrator and we'll also show that in our dashboard so you can take the appropriate actions. Um, the appropriate actions are basically going into the radar platform and then instantiating a recovery of the infected files. Uh, so you have the ability to do that in a granular way, only restore the impacted files, or you would still have the ability to live mount or instantly recover full workloads as well uh, using our uh, CDM platform. So let me now jump into the demo. Hopefully that will work. So I'll have to try and share my screen again. Philippe, would you like me to share your screen? Yeah, if you can try that, that would be yeah, interesting. No problem. But, uh... So, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, so, this is really the um, the uh, interface to our um, Polaris uh, environment. So again, this is a SaaS service. It's hosted uh, in the public cloud. So there's no on-premises installation component associated with this. Uh, what you can see when you log into the system is it's uh, also a global manager of all the rubric systems that you would have deployed worldwide. So if you're using a rubric across multiple different infrastructures or different estates, all of those systems would show up. They would coalesce all of their event information into this uh, Polaris environment. And then you can uh, trace uh, the events over time and sort of figure out based on trending information uh, if the system is uh, operating in a healthy fashion, yes or no. But as part of that events, uh, we'll also display uh, anomalies that we have detected, again, across the entire state. So all of these events are fed into the system. And then in this case, in the last 24 hours, I can also filter this for the last week. But in this case, for the last 24 hours, we have detected three anomalous events according to our uh, radar system. So really what that looks like then is if you click into this environment, uh, we'll show you the objects that we feel are impacted. Um, the object in this case is a physical Windows host. It's a, a virtual machine. And so it's two virtual machines and a Windows host in this case. So this is the past day. I can also go to the past week and see the full impact the past month, et cetera, et cetera. So if you go back to the past day and focus on those three events, what you can see is uh, you can then click on each individual object and we'll show you some additional information. So we'll show you a timeline of the, uh, of the actual impact uh, in terms of file system activity. So each and every time we take this backup, there's this measurement of uh, file system activity and we'll show you what we think is suspicious versus what we think is normal. So all of a sudden here you have this spike of suspicious activity uh, whereby we saw you know 2,100 suspicious files and we also saw 2,100 files being deleted uh, in this you know between these two uh, snapshot events. The event timeline sort of explains in a bit more detail uh, how confident our machine learning model is about all of this. Um, so what you see here is that we have detected anomalous file system activity. So this is the stage one analysis. And in the stage two analysis, we say that we have high confidence uh, of high levels of encryption. Um, what you can do then is you now have the ability to follow the suggested actions that we make. So in this case, the suggested action is to investigate the snapshot that we think is suspicious. So you click on the action. What we then show you is the full index of that uh, object that we find suspicious. So you have the full file system in this case. Uh, we'll also indicate in that file system view where we think these suspicious files are located. So in this case, it's in uh, it's in the file shares. You can see all of the folders in the file shares and where we find these uh, suspicious events. So if I click open uh, one of these particular suspicious events, um, what you can see here is that there's this PowerPoint file which we've deleted and the PowerPoint file was added again. And it was added again with the 
uh, .encrypted extension. So that's a quite clearly a suspicious, a suspicious file, but that's just one of the things we track to figure out if this is a real uh, ransomware event or not. So what you can then do is you can say, I'm now convinced that all of these files, uh, all of these deleted files, uh, so those are the original files that I wanna bring back. So what you can do is you can select or multi-select the files that you want to restore, and then you do next. And now you have the ability to either recover to a separate folder, overwrite the original files, or download the files. So the idea now really is that if you, through your defense in depth system, have determined that you know the ransomware uh, has been cleaned up, you could potentially just overwrite the original files and restore them back. Or what you could also do is you can spin up a, a new system, a clean system, a copy using LiveMind, for example, and then just download the only the impacted files into that system. So the idea is we want to minimize the loss uh, of data between the impacted uh, backup. Um, so the idea really is that if there were files that were not impacted by ransomware and you do a, a full snapshot restore, you're also deleting the data uh, of the people that weren't impacted. So that's something we'll try to minimize through this very granular recovery operation. Uh, so just in, uh, for the demo, I'll just restore it to, uh, to, to uh, a new folder and you click recover uh, and that's it really. Uh, so that's the only thing you had to do and now you can follow along in the events. Uh, it will probably take a couple of minutes and then that data set uh, that data set will be uh, will be restored. So just let me refresh. And in a couple of minutes, you'll see that we'll, we have queued that restore operation uh, and that data is, uh, is ready to be used again. And you can sort of continue running uh, from that point on. That's sort of it for the for the quick demo and uh, and the introduction to the uh, to the ransomware recovery system of uh, of Rubrik. So I'll uh, I'll hand it back to uh, Joe or Daniela then. Thank you, Philippe. Um, okay. So. Okay, thank you, Philippe, for that um, very insightful uh, presentation there. Um, we've actually received a few questions uh, throughout the webinar, so I'm just going to spend some time going through that and giving Philippe a chance to answer answer those questions. So one user said has asked, um, how does Rubrik integrate with legacy systems? Uh, yeah, that's actually a good question so we from a ransomware recovery perspective if you wanted to use that radar system um, that radar system is sort of assuming that you have rubric as a backup solution uh, because those two are intertwined uh, fairly well um, so you need to take the backup using rubric cdm uh, to enable uh, enable radar um, so the first uh, thing that we typically do is if we go to an existing customer, a brownfield customer, and all customers are brownfield because everybody already has an existing backup solution, of course, uh, is will sort of gradually replace uh, your existing environment with Rubrik. Uh, this can happen through a new project, for example, where you you know start with onboarding your uh, you know your new cloud-based infrastructure uh, onto Rubrik, and then slowly over time we can sort of uh, on board all of the legacy workloads as well. Um, but yeah, in general, we uh, we do have a dependency on, on, on the rubric backup for the uh, ransomware recovery piece. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, how do you install this ransomware solution? Uh, yeah, so in terms of installation, there's nothing to be done. Uh, so you basically uh, enable the radar license and the radar license uh, gives you then um, the, the, the radar capability in your existing Polaris instance. Uh, and then basically from that point on, we start uh, tracking anomalies in your infrastructure. So there's nothing to be, uh, nothing to be installed. Brilliant. Um, so and the next question asks, every day there are new strengths on malware and ransomware. Uh, how do you keep this detection system up to date? Uh, yeah, good point. So we, 
don't use a signature-based detection uh, for ransomware. Uh, so if you, you would if you would use something like uh, you know signature-based detection, you would have to indeed make sure that you're very up to date with the you know new strains of ransomware. And every time something changes, uh, you're reliant on the fact that you need this uh, centralized update. Uh, the way that our machine learning model works is it's a combination of the activity of the file system. Uh, so it's really behavioral based. So what we do is we've looked at uh, what are the behavioral results of ransomware. So what's the actual outcome? What happens on a on a on an application? What what happens on a file system if you're impacted through ransomware? And those are the signs we take into account to figure out if it's an anomaly or not an anomaly, and if that's related to ransomware. So we sort of forego the signature-based approach, which is why we don't have to update our system. Uh, on a sort of daily or you know hourly basis, um, um, basically we we continuously tweak our machine learning model, but we tweak it to look for let's say the the results or the signs of ransomware, and not so much the the strains of new ransomware or new signatures. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, we have one final question, and that is um, how, uh, no, sorry, can I use this without the rubric backup piece? Um, no, so you would actually need to have the rubric backup system in place to be uh, to be able to, uh, to use radar. What you do have um, uh, without radar, uh, if you simply onboard rubric is the immutable file system capabilities. So, so that's a piece you would have uh, even without the anomaly detection and the ransomware detection system. Yes, you would have the benefit of that immutable file system, but uh, yeah, both of them are reliant upon each other, let's say. Brilliant, thank you, Philippe. Um, that appears to be all the questions that we've received. Um, if you have any questions after this webinar, please, um, please feel free to contact us at tummy more at bytes.co.uk um, we'll be happy to answer any questions or direct it to the um, relevant specialist um, right this appears to be the end of our webinar um, before um, signing out please do fill out the critique form um, it's really useful for us to um, gather that information and help you as much as possible in your journey um, with us okay many thanks for joining and yeah, have a wonderful day.